Welcome back to another episode of the Smart Way to Strong podcast. Today, we are joined by Chris Holt. Chris Holt has recently done one of our WOWs, our workout of the week. And we're super excited to have him on to share a little bit more about his background and why fun is the most important thing when it comes to working out for him. Hi, Chris. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, so excited. Welcome and thank you for making it work. It's always fun getting the time zones coordinated between Australia and the US. It's, I mean, you, you're in the future. It's like cool, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Um, for those unfamiliar with your background and your story, we've chatted a little bit before we started the podcast, but can you walk us through what inspired you to get into fitness and when did you start getting into CrossFit? Um, all right, I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes version. Um, so, uh, I'm an identical triplet. My brothers and I were adopted from Korea. Uh, my mom is from New York. My dad's from Pennsylvania. Uh, so we were, we came to the States when we were 16 months old or so. And, um, my dad worked for ExxonMobil. So we moved all over the world. So it was, uh, Italy, Singapore, London, and Norway. And so for me in moving to different countries and being thrust into cultures and customs and languages, um, the one thing that I had was sport, you know, like that was something that was universal. So um, my brothers and I love playing basketball and that's kind of how we made friends. I mean, people would, we never had to go out of our way to make friends just because people were fascinated by triplets. So they'd just say hi to us. But, uh, but yeah, so sports was just that thing that I identified with at a young age and I, I, I loved it. And so um, fast forward, um, I went to the University of Miami School of Architecture uh, I was in a five-year architecture program, and when I graduated in 06, I um, was working for a firm downtown for a couple of years, and I found CrossFit in 2005. And CrossFit was, I mean, the way I found it was through the movie 300, right? We all saw that movie, and we're like, what are those guys doing? And uh, I looked it up, and they were training out of gym in, uh, uh, in Utah, here actually, where I live now called Jim Jones. And then I started following their website. And then I started seeing that they were getting workouts from something called CrossFit, looked up CrossFit. And I was like, oh, that's what I need to start doing. So I was following that program online just because it was just CrossFit.com back then. Um, and then 2008 hit, building stopped, the economy over here, and most of places crashed. And so I decided to leave my profession as an architect to open at the time, the second CrossFit affiliate in Miami in 2008, uh, which was scary because, you know, it's that conversation that yeah, I had to have with my parents where I, I, I remember getting all my friends together. I'm like, I need to practice this on you guys because I'm, I'm about to tell my parents I'm, I'm leaving architecture. And you know, I put all this money into my education. I've wanted to be an architect since I was in like seventh grade. And now I'm like, no, nah, I'm done. And so I remember telling them and they, I just remember a lot of yelling. Um, <laughs> you don't know anything about owning a business, you don't know anything about running a gym and like, how can you just throw away your career and your five-year degree and blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, I just feel like this is something that everyone's going to do. And back in 2008, CrossFit was still growing, but it wasn't what it is now. And so I just remember a lot of my friends thought I was an idiot. Um, most people, especially in Miami, didn't even know what CrossFit was. And I just said, no, this is going to be on TV. This is going to be big. This is gonna to get to a point where every third person is gonna be doing this, or you know someone that does it, right? It's kind of like yoga. Like I don't do yoga, but I know lots of people that do yoga, right? So open that uh, affiliate, uh, owned it and operated it for a decade, and then um, left Miami because I was there for almost 17, 18 years, and I was just like, I'm done. I can't take the heat and humidity. It's like affecting my, my mood. I didn't realize weather had such an effect on my mood. And then moved out to Salt Lake City in 2018. I uh, was out here for a couple years and then um, with my now ex-wife. And then I had a job opportunity with, um, I don't know if you know who he is, uh, Liver King. Um, yeah, so that's my old boss. And uh, <laughs> you both like. Uh, it was a interesting year and then um, left that um, to then kind of relaunch my online coaching business. And that afforded me to just be wherever I wanted. So I wanted to move back to the mountains, the seasons, the cold weather, dry climate. And so I moved back out here to Salt Lake uh, like three weeks ago. Oh, so fresh, fresh move. What a journey. It's been a journey. <laughs> <laughs> really funny because 
although I haven't done any of the journey as long as you did, I came from like wanting to become an architect, then to do civil engineering and then changed and stopped civil and became a PT. And I had a similar thing with like friends and stuff from home. They're like, you finished best off the school and you're just a PT. I'm like, leave me alone. <laughs> yeah. And, and what happened was I, I left and then everyone started getting laid off because building was stopping. And then everyone was like, wow, you got out at the right time. And I was like, well, I, I, I think my journey has been a lot of uh, luck. You know, I think um, opening your own business, you, you quickly realize, you know, you're on your own. You got to make things happen, right? You can't just rely on a steady paycheck. And if you're not, you know, hustling, then you're not going to eat, right? And so then that's a different motivator, right? It's interesting how there's parallels between like, I guess, a fitness journey as well as starting your own business. It's like, it really tells, like, I think all, like all of us, or I can't speak for, you know, V, but I think what we've all shared in the past is that we all came into this because we were just somewhat, I hate using the word passion, but we were somewhat motivated to improve people's lives in fitness and, and, and health after experiencing our own journeys. And then as soon as you enter the industry very quickly, you're like, I'm supposed to be an entrepreneur actually. Like, and that realization is just so immediate and, and, and how like, yeah, it, it's such a cool journey that you've had as well. That that's one thing that I, I found more rewarding. I felt like, <clears throat> You know, I wanted to be an architect because that's just something I had always dreamed of becoming. And then when you get out there, you realize, uh, you know, architects, I think, are um, some levels egomaniacs and they're all about them. And it's like, I'm going to make this building and design and it's going to last the test of time. And this is like my footprint on the world where for me, I'm like, I don't think I'm making a difference in architecture. Right. Especially when you get out in the real world, you realize you're not designing anything. You're doing other people's designs. And then you're like, oh, this kind of sucks. And then when I started the CrossFit gym and, and started working with people on an like, individual basis and you know, getting someone to lose weight, getting someone to feel more confident, getting someone to extend their life, you know, it's that to me, you know, getting your first pull-up, getting your first muscle-up, getting your first PR, whatever it is in fitness, I felt like I'm making a bigger difference on a smaller scale with an individual. And that to me is more rewarding, right? And so, um, yeah, I mean, I still am paying off student loans, which bothers me, but like, <laughs> it's like, it's okay. It's okay. Like I, I found my path and it's, it's all good. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's weird. Even fitness, I think that we all go through ebbs and flows in terms of what's working for you, right? You know, before CrossFit, I was just doing bodybuilding. Right. Like I had four lung surgeries, um, four collapsed lungs and four surgeries uh, from eighth grade to my freshman year of college. And so for me, it was, you know, going from being very active to going to not being very active. And then that, you know, like drastically affected my mental health. And <clears throat> then, you know, I was doing bodybuilding because I got to the University of Miami after my last lung surgery and I was like 117 pounds. I was like so skinny. And then I just thought, all right, I'm going to, I'm in Miami. It's all about the beach bod. So like, just eat whatever you want and just lift heavy and don't work out your legs. Just wear jeans. It's all good. Right. And then, <laughs> and then I, I ballooned up to, I think my biggest was 195 by my, uh, because I was in a five-year program by my fourth year of college, I was, I gained like 70 pounds and I thought I looked great. You know, I was like, man, I look, I feel jacked. And then I look at the pictures and I'm just like, I look bloated, you know? And no, uh, no. And then you go through the, that. And I was like, okay, I don't want to be big anymore. I just want to be lean. I want to be like Brad Pitt lean. So then I just ran marathons. I didn't lift. And I was like, all right, now I've dropped 40 pounds and I just look sad. I look like, Man, get that kid a burger. I don't know. Like he doesn't look very well. And then I found CrossFit. And I was like, oh, like now you can be strong and fast, or you could do that endurance, but then still lift. And then, you know, when I started CrossFit, I couldn't do one pull up. Like that's how weak I was from just running all the time. And then CrossFit was the first program I'd ever run into that really talked about nutrition. You know, I don't think they do it so much on their um, website as I mean they do. There, I think there's a section for there, but. Even when you get certified, they, they go through, you know, um, back when I was getting, when I got certified, it was all about the zone diet, but 
Um, but it was the first time that I was like, okay, well, I need to think about what I'm fueling my body with for me to not only perform well, because it was all about performance with CrossFit and like competing. Um, but then it was like, oh, that's how I get abs. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, I, I, I thought it was just lots of cardio and just do a thousand sit-ups a day. And that's just like, no, dummy, it's nutrition. <laughs> and then that's kind of how I've fallen into what I do now is just helping people understand that nutrition is the foundation. And people will say, oh, it's like 60, 40, 70, 30. I'm like, I think it's 99.9% .9 of it, right? Because, you know, if, if you piss in your car's gas tank, it's not going to run. Yet everyone thinks that they're putting premium fuel in their engines. They're like, yeah. And then they wonder why they perform on a subgrade level, right? So, but it's the ebbs and flows and it's trial and error, right? Um, because, you know, back in the day, I thought, oh my gosh, there's nothing better than a bicep curl. And then when you get into CrossFit, it's like, we don't do that. Like, no isolated muscles. And I actually kicked someone out of my gym one time because they were doing a bicep curl in the corner. And my business partner comes up, he's like, bro, you cannot do that. I'm like, he was doing a bicep curl. We don't do that in CrossFit. And he's like, they're paying. We won't have clients if you kick people out. And I was like, oh yeah. And now I've just, I'm totally like, hey, anything. If you want to do Zumba, awesome. Like whatever gets you moving, I don't care, right? And that you can be consistent with and you enjoy, do it, you know? And that's where I think the fitness industry is a really weird place because it's all about like, oh, those are the bodybuilders. Oh, those are power lifters. Oh, those are the CrossFitters. And it's just like, it doesn't need to be like that. You know, I think people that do things like that on social media are just insecure. And, you know, it's, there is no one right way, right? It's, you know, whatever, like I said, you can be consistent with, so. That's so true. The fitness industry is very much black and white and you're either going one way or the other, but there's no in between. Whereas I feel like, especially we are a lot more in the happy me medium and we don't go full on one side and full on the other side. And then we get told off that we're too in between <laughs> and wait with our answers. And I'm like, well, it depends. Everything depends and everything is dependent on the goal of someone. And yeah, I totally agree that you should do whatever suits you and whatever works for you. With your surgeries, um, how did you go with the surgery and recovering from that? And how has that impacted your training or like outlook on life? Because I feel like being a triplet and having multiple lung surgeries, you're really someone special. Yeah. <laughs> and I just had heart surgery um, five months ago. So I was, so with the lung surgeries, um, <clears throat> the way that they described it to me was that I was born with blisters on my lungs called blebs does not sound like a very medical term i'm like bleb like that's the best you could do uh, yeah <laughs> so they rupture what if there's too much pressure in my chest cavity they rupture and then my lung collapses <clears throat> so the surgeries i've had i've had pleurodesis is done thoracotomies where they just basically go in they cut out these large blisters they staple them or suture them close um and then they basically try to create an adhesion between my lung wall and my chest wall so they'll throw in like a, a towel flap like powder and it acts as an adhesive and so it attaches my lung wall to my chest wall so it doesn't collapse so i've had that surgery done once on each side and both times they didn't do them correctly so i had to have them both redone and so <clears throat> that was a, a very long painful recovery um i'm talking like eight eight months maybe nine ten like almost a year before i could just do stuff. Um, I mean, still parts of my, my ribs are still numb. I, I'm never going to get sensation back from that. Um, but that was a very long, painful procedure. And my first chest tube was in Norway and, uh, they don't give you anesthesia. So I was 16 and they're like, all right, we're going to give you some Novocaine for the incision. And we're just going to insert this tube into your chest cavity. And I was like, well, don't you put me under They're like, no, no, we don't need to do that. I'm like, I get we live in the land of Vikings, but like, what? Like, we live in the modern world, what? And so it was the longest 30 minutes of my life because you don't feel the incision, you don't feel them, you feel the pressure, but then once it gets inside your chest cavity, there's no Novocaine there. And so you feel every inch that they're shoving this thing into your chest cavity. And it was just like, it was terrible. And so I think experiencing that type of pain at such a young age and understanding how fragile life is and mortality and and all this stuff, it, it just aged me very quickly. Like I, I had a very different outlook on life. And, and so fast forward now, I was, I was also born with a congenital heart defect called a bicuspid aortic valve. So your aortic valve has three leaflets that open and close. I was born with two. 
Um, so there is an opening in my heart, my aortic valve, which causes backflow. Um, it, and then what happens is over, I'm going to be 41 in, in, in December. For the past 40 years, my body has been kind of trying to close that opening by calcification and like closing it. So now I'm having stenosis of the valve and all these things. And so, you know, my cardiologist, he said, look, you're asymptomatic, which is odd because you should be lightheaded. You should be passing out while you work exercise. He says, you're only getting maybe 65% of the amount of blood and oxygen a normal person gets. And we don't understand how you've been able to sustain CrossFit style exercise for over 10 years. And I was like, and there's like, but your body's figured it out, but that doesn't change the fact that you need the surgery sooner or later. And so I was putting it off for years because I was like, I don't have any symptoms. Having the trauma from those four lung surgeries, like, I don't, don't want to do that. And this time they have to break open my chest. Like, no, because at least through my lung surgeries, they asked me, we can go through your sternum or through your back. And I was like, do you have to break my sternum if you go through uh, my chest? And they're like, yes. And I said, and you don't have to do that on my back. And they're like, no, I said, go through the back. And he says, well, that's going to be a longer recovery. And I was like, I don't care. And I was like, literally six months, I couldn't sit up straight because they had moved all my muscles and all my intercostal muscles had moved around. So I was like leaning over because I had no function in that left side of my body. And that was terrible, you know? Um, so I put off the heart surgery and then finally I decided to do it because they're like, look, you're 40, you're young for most people that have this done, they're in their seventies. Like our Schwarzenegger has the same heart issue and he had the surgery done. Um, so I had it done and, um, yeah, I mean, they replaced my valve with a mechanical valve and the, my cardiologist out of surgery is like, brother, your valve was equivalent to a 90 year old. So like if you were at any point in time, you could have had a heart arrhythmia and just literally died in the gym. So you would have been one of those stories that everyone's going to talk about. They're like, that super fit dude just died of a heart attack. And it's just like, ugh. so I'm glad I did it. Um, but one thing I noticed is that my anxiety was getting worse and I've always had some form of anxiety, depression, PTSD. And so my anxiety was getting worse, um, as I was getting older and I thought it was just life, you know, um, a year working for liver King, that definitely was very anxiety driven. And so, um, I just thought that was just normal and I was having like full on panic attacks at least once or twice a week. And so then once they replaced the valve, I remember it was like maybe a few days, I was still in a lot of pain, but I was just sitting in the hospital and I just had this overwhelming feeling of like calm. And I, I, and it really bothered me because I didn't know what it was. I couldn't put my finger on it. I'm like, why does something feel so weird? I don't know what it, and then as I started to heal and I just had my thoughts and the pain was going away because, you know, like I was recovering, I realized my anxiety was going. So then I went to my physician. I said, is that like, what, what? And he says, well, think about it. Your body's not getting enough what it needs. And it knows that you might not consciously know that. So panic attacks, that makes sense. So I'm like, oh my God, I should have done this 10 years ago, <laughs> you know? Um, so recovering from all that stuff, I think that exercise has been one thing that has been a blessing, but then also a curse because you know, I just want to get back into it. Right. And you just want to, and then you start, we all know this. So like you start comparing yourself to where you once were, and then you get down about it. You're like, Oh my gosh, like, look how skinny I am. I mean, I lost so much weight after my, my heart surgery, um, and my lung surgeries. And then it's just like, what I've learned over the years is that, you know, you have to enjoy the process of rebuilding. You got to get rid of the, the past self pictures, videos, just scrap them. Don't look at them because they're not going to serve you. Um, because you are just going to be your own worst enemy, um, because we're all our most harshest critics. Right. So for me, I just learned, all right, I'm starting back at square one. So I just enjoy the process of exercising, be grateful that you can do this. And so, um, and this is kind of where Vitruvian came in with the heart stuff is that, you know, a lot of people are reaching out to me because they're, this is the most common congenital heart defect on the planet, like bicuspid aortic valve. And so, um, a lot of people reach out and they're like, I'm scared to work out again. I'm scared of doing this. I'm scared of doing that. I'm like, I, I don't know what the roadmap looks like. And I tell them, look, like eccentric loading is a really great way to start getting into exercise without jacking up your heart rate. And that's one awesome feature with the Vitruvian, right? It has a mode where you just do eccentric loading. And I, I tell people that reach out and I said, look, if you want to do exercise, 
I mean, eccentric loading, just do negatives and then, you know, put the weight down, you know, and then stand up or whatever it is. But the great thing about the platform and uh, Vitruvian is that, you know, it's a lot easier to do that with, than with like equipment, right? Um, <clears throat> because it's very hard for you to do an eccentric loading movement on a, on like a, like a bench press. And then all of a sudden not have the load there, right? Because it's always there. It's, you know, so with the, the, the platform, it allows you to just deload, stand up and then repeat that rep. So, um, it's been vital for me, especially just for all of us, our mental health. I think exercise is one of those things that it's, uh, it's, a, it has a direct impact on those things in a, a positive way. And, you know, that's kind of what I want to share is just like, look, movement, nutrition, all this stuff is medicine. Um, but too often people just overlook it or come up with an excuse why they don't want to do it. And, um, you know, it's life is too short, right? It's like, I mean, people think they have time, but they don't, you know? Um, so, yeah. I really like what you said about rebuilding and deleting everything, because I can only imagine that if you go and you get your fitness level up and then you have to restart again and you get your fitness level up and you have to restart again, that you still keep going is quite impressive because I can only imagine it would be quite hard and mentally challenging to go through and like start from zero and you know how far you came beforehand. If there's like other people going through health issues, what is your advice if they have to overcome those mental challenges and mental blocks after I would, surgery? Yeah, I would say that... <clears throat> If you're dealing with health issues, I mean, first and foremost, you know, obviously go see a physician, but my issue with doctors, especially in this country, is that the solution for them, plan A is always going to be some type of pharmaceutical intervention. And I have no issues with pharmaceuticals. Um, one of my older brothers is a chief resident and professor at Yale University. He's a very smart Ivy League doctor, you know, teacher. Um, but he's the first one to tell you that I'm not trained to talk to my patients about changing their lifestyle. And he's a primary care physician. And he says, look, because medical schools in this country are funded by pharmaceutical companies. And so we're very good at prescribing a medication and that's how we're trained. And it's a pill for an ill model. Right. And, and he understands the, the, the issues with that. Right. Um, so I would say first and foremost, obviously see a physician, get blood work done. I think blood work is the gold standard to figure out what's going on. And uh, honestly, it's always just nutrient deficiencies. That's it. Right. But too often people throw a medication at it, then it creates another symptom. And then you get another medication, medication for that symptom and snowball effect. So I would say first and foremost, get some blood work done, see where, um, you know, there's lots of companies out there just do like biomarkers just to see where, you know, for men, testosterone or estrogen for women or you know, um, down to, um, literally like your B vitamins or iron or, you know, whatever it is, you can test for those things. Um, but then the next thing I would say is it goes back to this idea of time. You know, I think turning 40 made me realize that, um, like I have a calendar right up here. Uh, it's my life in weeks. And so if you live to 80, uh, which is average, um, you have about 4,000 weeks of life, right? So on that calendar, I can quickly see that half of my life is over. It's done, right? So the second half is not guaranteed. So for me, turning 40 and having a new heart and literally a new lease on life, I'm like, I have to be very intentional with what I'm doing, how I'm doing it, who I'm spending my time with. And because we all have this idea that we have time but you can get hit by a bus tomorrow. So like what then, right? Because people just make excuses and excuses. And then all those things stem from a place of fear. And that fear stems from honestly, like death, right? Like death is a real thing. Death is something I think about all the time. Um, but it doesn't need to be a morbid thing. I think it can be used as a motivator and, um, to give you perspective. And like I said, for someone, and I know lots of people that have been through way worse than me physically, um, it, it ages you, it makes you think about the world differently. And as soon as people start realizing, wow, I don't have that much time, right? So what am I doing, wasting my time coming up with an excuse, right? And too often it's, it's the fear of, oh, what if it doesn't work out? What if uh, I don't reach my goal? Uh, what if this happens? And then people are always living in the past. 
And some of the best advice I got at a young age was from my basketball coach when I was in high school. I had my first lung surgery. I was super depressed. And he just said, hey, you know, I'm going to give you this piece of advice. Um, I'm not going to explain it to you, but you'll figure it out. And I was 16. I was super angry. And he just said, picture yourself straddling the line. Your left foot's in the past, your right foot's in the future, and you're pissing on the present. And at 16, I was like, ugh, well, that's, that's a weird visual. Like, what's that mean, coach? And he's like, get out of my office, you'll figure it out. And for years, it haunted me. And then I realized, look, it's watering the bridge. Take the silver lining from things that have happened, but that's it. It's done. Let it go. And then living in what ifs, you can't predict the future, right? So if you want to dictate where you want to go in this life, you have to focus on what you have control over, and that's in the present. And it's hard, right? It's hard to be present. I mean, I've read all the books, Eckhart Tolle, Power of Now, like awesome, but it's difficult because our minds are always wanting drama. It always wants to like create some type of friction. And um, as soon as you can kind of slow down and again, to go back to your question, it's just telling, like helping people realize like, look, you don't have that much time. So like, you know, you only have one ticket, you know, why, why live in misery? Why live with this chronic issue? Why live with whatever it is and just accept it? You know, that's kind of a sad life, you know? So I, I, I really implore people to stand, stand back and just realize that people have more agency in their lives than they think. And it's just because we're focusing on the wrong things, because when you focus on things you don't have control over, then you feel like you have no control in your life. But if you can focus on things you do have control over, then you have more agency. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm just taking it all in. That's, yeah. <laughs> so such good, smart advice. I think people get really caught up in like worrying about the future and always thinking what's next, what's next, what's next. When that you said it, like we should really just enjoy where we are and focus on what's right in front of us right now, rather than worrying about everything that has happened and everything that's going to happen. That's really, really cool. Is that sort of why your whole approach is to moving fitness into making fitness fun as well? Yeah. So the whole four funsies, if you follow me on Instagram, like every time I do a workout, it's four funsies. And the reason I started doing that is because I came from CrossFit. I came from three, two, one, go, you know, like just like, you got to go faster and you, you got to beat that time. You got to get a PR and like all this stuff. And for years, it just, it was fun in the beginning, but then it stressed me out. And then I realized I'm 40. I don't need to be the fastest. I don't need to be the strongest. I really don't care about performance that much anymore. I just want to be able to look a certain way 365 and I don't want to be injured. So for me, I just do high volume training. It's still CrossFit in some sense, in terms of doing functional multi-joint movements, but uh, it's not for time because for me, if you can't enjoy your workouts, then you're not going to do them. So people ask me, oh, you did 10 rounds for funsies. Like how long did it take you? I'm like, I don't know. I mean, I just did it, you know? And for me, <clears throat> I'd rather lift lighter loads at higher rep schemes to stay safer and injury free because I have injured myself in the past. Um, that's really all it is. Like all of us, I think once you break 40, it's like, I just want to stay in the game. <laughs> I just want to stay in the game as long as I can and whatever I need to do, I'm going to do it. And I tell a lot of people, look, you know, just find something you can be consistent with. Um, enjoy the workouts. Don't. And I think people coming from CrossFit at my age, they, everyone, I've never met someone that says, I disagree with you. It's like, yeah, I don't care about deadlifting heavyweight. I don't care about percentages anymore. And it's like, I just want to, not be injured. And I want to still look good naked. And I was like, yeah, me too. We all do. Right. So that's why you got to focus on what you're consuming in terms of food and fuel, hydrating, focusing on sleep, um, you know, and all the stuff that honestly, I, that liver King promotes, I do believe in, I do believe in the ancestral way, right. Is getting early morning sun, you know, cold exposure, heat exposure, um, spending and making time to bond with loved ones, creating connections and relationships, which are only going to serve us better as we age, because sooner or later, you know, I've come to grips that I put a lot of self-worth into and my identity and self-worth into my physical stature. And I realize we all know this. I mean, sooner or later, my body's going to fail me. And so I, what am I going to do then? Right. And that kind of scares me because I'm like, Oh my God, I'm going to get, I'm really depressed. Like I'm depressed now. Like I'm going to be super depressed. But then I realized it's about your relationships, you know, your, your friendships, your, your, 
relationships with your family members and all those things, because if you can have deep, meaningful relationships that will extend your life, right? So it's little things that people overlook that will pay dividends in the end, but you've got to start yesterday, just like nutrition, just like exercise. People are like, you know, I lifted, you know, five days this week. Why don't I have abs? I'm like, that's not how that works, you know? So, you know, I think it's, um, it's, it's hard, you know, because I think, especially now there's just too much information on the internet and people get so confused and they get overwhelmed and then people are always demonizing one thing or the other. And trust me, I used to do that. I was the demonizer. I demonized food. I demonized other fitness programs. And as I've gotten older, I'm just like, no, all that stuff is garbage, right? There's no such thing as good or bad food. There's no such thing as healthy or unhealthy. We need to change our relationships and psychology with food because as soon as we start demonizing food, then we create this negative stigma around that food. The food is not the problem. It's how often are you eating that food, right? It's lifestyle habits. It's your routines. And so, and even with fitness programs, it's like, hey, you want to just power lift? Impressive. Cool. You want to be a bodybuilder? Have at it. I could never do that. Like that's a full-time job with the eating, you know, like real full-time job. You know, I have friends that go out in their cars and eat while we're out. And they're like, I'm going to the bathroom. I'm like, you don't need to say you're going to the bathroom. Just say you're going to the car, eat your chicken and rice or whatever you're doing. Like, it's okay. Um, but whatever it is, I'm a, I'm a fan of it, right? And I think that we need to be more like that because I think also we live in a world where everything's all polarized and it's like, you're going to offend someone. And it's like, look, you know, it's because everyone's trying to pick a side. And I, I'm like, there are no sides. I think it's like same team, same team, but no one ever sees it like that, right? Do you have any um, tips on making nutrition a little bit more fun? Because I feel like training people understand to some degree. And I feel like nutrition is always the one where people struggle the most. with. Yeah. So that's a good question. I don't know if I've ever made nutrition fun. Um, I mean, if you could do that and bottle it, you could be a millionaire, right? <laughs> um, I think for me, it's more about helping my clients on a daily basis, because that's the only way that change is going to happen. Because without daily accountability, consistency drops to zero. And without consistency, then you, it's physically impossible to create a new habit, right? So my program and what I offer to my clients is a system where you are having a coach that is holding you accountable every day. You send three food pictures a day. And look, there are tons of different plans out there in terms of nutritional plans, and they're all great. I, I have no issues. I mean, veganism, I can say, all right, look, I'm not against veganism, but you are going to be anemic. You're going to be deficient in a lot of like major macronutrients and micronutrients. Um, and I get the whole, you know, ethical thing. And it's like, okay, fine. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, there is no one size fits all plan for anyone, right? Um, but I do believe there's a good jumping off point for everyone. And that's just starting with three balanced meals a day, you know, and we can get into the intermittent fasting and stuff like that. But then, you know, intermittent fasting, I think and most of my clients are women. I'm like, you know, based on hormones, it's not always the best, especially if you're going through perimenopause, menopause, I mean, crushing your eating window down to six or eight hours, I just don't think is a good idea for your hormones, right? And a lot of people don't think like, they just think, oh, well, it's easier to lose weight that way. Or it's, it's just easier for me to do that. It's like, okay, but also you're not going to be able to cram all the nutrients you need in six to eight hours. And you're definitely not going to hit your protein. And at the end of the day, protein is king, you know, for all of us, men and women and everyone in between, because as soon as you start losing muscle mass, you're out the door. And we see this with cancer patients all the time. So you need to keep muscle mass on. And that the way you can do that is eating foods that help build muscle, right? Um, so in terms of making it fun, I, I don't know if we can make it fun, but allowing, giving them the support that they need on a daily basis, in my experience is the best way to help someone in the moment, because if you get triggered by something and then you want to go cope with food and you have no one to talk to, you're probably going to take the path of least resistance and like eat a cookie or cope with alcohol or drugs or whatever it is. So if you have someone there to say, Hey, I'm at this event right now and there's a big platter of cupcakes and I just want to eat them. It's better to have someone say, Hey, you know what? It's not that you can't have them. 
tell yourself, you, it's not that you can't have them, just tell yourself you choose not to have them now. Because I want people to treat themselves with food only once they have control. And it's a conscious choice they're making and it's not an emotion or food making the choice for them, which is typically what it is. So as soon as we can start changing that psychology, giving people more control and helping them realize that I can control this, I don't have to give in to these things. And more importantly, we need to talk about how to manage stress because that is the underlying cause to, and the, the root issue as to why we all make the choices we make is when we're stressed. So if you don't have good stress management tools, coping, or like, like just like box breathing, super easy thing you can do, just run in the bathroom, just do it for three minutes. I promise you, it'll bring your heart rate down, right? In a stressful situation. But people don't know how to manage stress. So that's why things go off the rails. So I wish I could make nutrition fun. I think the fun part about nutrition with me and my coaches is that, you know, I laugh with my clients all the time, you know? Um, you know, like I have one client, uh, I have this, this thing I tell my clients to do, like um, in the beginning, it's tough, changing nutrition, changing, cutting things out, eliminating things for a little bit. And so she just said, everything's going wrong. And I'm like, okay, I'm sure not everything's going wrong, but like, I get it. And then she says, no, everything's just falling apart. I said, okay. I said, well, every night this week, I want you to take a notepad, not in your phone. I want you to physically write it down, write three things that were positive, three wins, three, just three things you're grateful for at the end of the day. So the first night she does it, she texts me. She's like, I have nothing. I said, okay, just take a second and think. So she's thinking, she's thinking, she's like, well, um, this is going to sound like TMI, but like this morning I had the best poop of my life. And I was like, win, win, write it down, write it down. Like that's a win. And she's like, really? I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's a win. She's like, oh, okay, okay. And so then that snowballed. And then she's like, okay, I can really find little things in my life that might seem random, weird, gross, whatever, that are little wins. And I think that once you, you go to bed feeling a sense of gratitude, you're going to wake up in a better state than going to bed thinking like life sucks. Everything sucks. You know, it's like the, the movie, the Lego movie was like, everything is awesome. You know, it's like, that's like, I want, I want you to feel like that. Like everything is awesome. Like it really, honestly, life is for the most part, for most of us is, you know, it's easy to focus on the dark stuff. Right. Um, but then I also tell people like, welcome it. You know, I welcome the dark moments because they help you appreciate the light ones, you know? So, So much powerful stuff there again. I think the gratefulness is one of my favorite things and we do it sometimes in our meetings as well, just to get back into the sense of things. And even if you're just grateful for the weather or coffee or whatever it is, it can be like a super small thing, but it just puts things into perspective. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at, at ancestral supplements, when I worked for liver King, like that was a, a ritual we did at the meetings. We would always share three wins. Or you can share struggles, but the rule was you always start with the struggle and then end with the win. Um, but it's just, it creates positive more momentum, right? Especially from a team building aspect of it, right? Um, so for my program, there's also a community group and that's a place where people can share wins and struggles. And then it's like, look, if you're going through it, I guarantee you someone else has to, right? Um, because the funny thing is, is that working with people for so long with nutrition, as much as we are all so unique and different, it's all very similar issues we all run into, right? And I don't think it's an issue of, I don't know what's healthy, unhealthy or whatever, um, which in the beginning, that's what they always like, what's, what's healthy? And I'm like, let's get rid of that word. Let's just, because I don't even like the word diet. I say, look, we're just on a plan. And that plan will change as you change. Like all plans should, but most plans don't. It's a very, this is it, you lose the weight, bye-bye. And then they give you no tools to thrive on your own and it's done by design. So you, they know you're going to either gain the weight back or resort back to old habits and patterns. And then you're going to come back and give them more money, right? My goal for my clients is to get them to a point where they can fire me. That's the goal. I don't want to work with people forever. Um, but ultimately it's helping them understand that like, you know, it's not, it's not about, you know, focusing on what's healthy, what's unhealthy or anything like that. I'm like, look, it's most people understand that real whole food, foods that are, you know, you know, have high fiber content are better for gut. Like people know these things, right? It's like, okay, eating, you know, ice cream or some fruit 
everyone knows fruit is probably better for you, right? Um, but I, what I've experienced is that it's people just don't have very good management skills within their lives, right? Especially parents because it gets hectic and it's mothers. Mothers are superheroes, right? Like they're selfless. It's, they always put themselves last and they don't expect anything in return, right? And it's just like, yeah, but you got to take care of yourself, right? And there's too much of the stigma that if you take care of yourself, then you're a selfish mother, you're a bad mom. And it's just like, that's a terrible thing that women believe, right? Because that's what societal pressures have ingrained in them. But I tell them, look, if you are on a plane and the oxygen masks fall down, whose mask do you put on first? Yours, right? Because if you can't breathe and you can't help a kid. So like, if you're not taking care of yourself, how are you showing up for your family? How are you showing up for your kid? You know, not in your best form, right? So I said, look, you need to be selfish and we need to change the stigma of that word. Being selfish is not always bad, you know? Um, so, but it's all psychology. That's what it is. It's all psychology. And if we don't talk about psychology, then no real long-term change is ever going to really happen um, because, you know, programs can get people to lose weight. But if you don't talk about their triggers, their traumas, um, then in my opinion, th they will always resort back to those old patterns. 100%. Um, if there's someone coming to you in their forties and they are a mom and they are having a busy life and they haven't maybe exercised or they haven't exercised in years, what's something that you get them to do or help them with to stay motivated or get started? Um, when they first so to ask someone that has been sedentary and just not taking care of themselves to ask them to, Hey, we're going to focus on nutrition. And by the way, you need to work out four to five times a week. Success rate drops to zero. So I always say that nutrition needs to be, you need to put all your mental bandwidth into that. Until things start to feel automated, that's your main focus. And then from exercise, that standpoint, I'm like, walk. Walking is low hanging fruit. It's overrated, um, or sorry, it's underrated in the sense that people think, oh, walking, you're not gonna do much. It's like, you can burn a lot of fat just by going for a walk, you know? And we don't need to hit that 10,000. 10,000 steps is just a bogus number. That was a marketing thing that some Japanese company did with a pedometer. Um, 8,000 steps is really great. If you can get 8,000 steps, which is really just, you know, a 20 to 30 minute walk in the morning and the evening, and you could break that 8,000 step and it's easy. Right. Um, and I always tell people take the stairs, don't take the elevator. You know, any, anytime I'm in an airport, I always take the stairs and I love it because no one's taking the stairs. And I see all these lazy people on escalators and I'm like lazy. And so, you know, I feel, and that's like, mm, yeah, I'm, you know, it's like, that's cool. I feel good about myself. So I would just tell people that you need to focus on nutrition first because that's the hardest part. And then if you don't want to get into a crazy exercise regimen, then just start walking, you know, so. I love that. Good advice. And now that we've got you on Vitruvian and writing workouts for our member base, what has like sparked your interest to sign up with Vitruvian outside of the eccentric training like we've mentioned before? And where do you see, like, what was your first impressions? Where do you see your workouts going and what can users expect from your workouts outside of just having fun and not time? Right? Yeah. What got me interested with Vitruvian, I think was, um, well, the only reason I knew about it <clears throat> originally was because Liver King um, uses it a lot. And so I'm like, okay, that's pretty cool. Like he has two of them, like ship with him wherever he goes in the world. And he's always just on this platform. And then when I physically used one for the first time, um, not only was it fun because it's just a different, it's different. And then you realize that this is a, a really, really impressive piece of tech. It's not cheap. It's not in terms of the feel of it. Um, that mag drive and that platform is like legit and it's humbling. Right. And I think also one thing that I've liked about it is that now I'm not concerned about the weight because lifting 90 pounds on deadlifting 90 pounds on that Vitruvian compared to deadlifting 95 pounds. No, not even, it doesn't even, I'm like, at first it messed with my head. I'm like, why am I struggling? It's only 90 pounds. Like, but this feels like it's like 225 right now. And then I thought, dummy, your body doesn't know, you know, that's just you having a, like ego, like, oh, I need to like lift like three wheels and whatever. And I, I just, I loved it. And I liked the fact that for people that are trying to start a, a home gym, 
you know, yes, the price point for the platform is higher than most people would want to spend, but if you break it down, it's cheaper, right? Um, the only thing that you would need, in my opinion, is just some cardio equipment, right? So you get cardio equipment and then you have the Vitruvian, you literally can do anything you want. I don't care if you're a power lifter. Um, okay, Olympic weightlifting, obviously, probably can't do too much of, obviously, with the, um, the platform as well, besides having a barbell. But other than that, it's, it's, it's so much less space. You know, it's just like, it's right there and it takes up no room. So for me, I like having it. At, and for me, I use it as a supplemental. It's not like my only thing that I do. So I wake up in the morning and I take a cold shower first, and then I'll um, do some meditation in front of my red light. And then I'll do the Vitruvian and I'll just do a simple routine. It's always either one movement or two movements, 10 rounds, um, always hitting um, 150 reps. So 15 of each. And um, yeah, it's really changed the way I, I view working out at home too. Like before I've done at home workouts and they're like, they're so boring. But this thing is like, it, it's the app is super easy to use. You can design your own workouts and it's fun, right? Um, and I think also based on the platform itself, it, and I don't know if this is true, but like, I feel like it forces you to be way more conscious of your form than you would be in a conventional gym, right? Um, and, you know, they have the different modes. Of, if they see you failing a rep, it's going to unload, right? Um, so then now we have safety components in here, which is really cool to train at home. Um, but with regards to future workouts, um, that people can expect, they're really going to be stuff that I do. And I, that's what I like. I want to, I want to share workouts that I do because people look at me, they see my physique and they're like, what do you do? I was like, this is what I do. And they're like, wow, that's a lot of reps. I'm like, I know, but I'd rather do lighter weight, higher rep schemes and do that and kind of, you know build muscle that way than, you know, doing like, I mean, look, I'm a massive Sam dancer fan, massive fan. I'm not going to lift his weight. Like his, one of his legs is the size of my torso. Like uh, that's not going to happen. You know? So I'm like, I'm going to keep that stuff to Sam. I, I'm going to, I'm going to, that. And I think that's why it's kind of cool that we have different, you know, types of people. Right. And I think I want to cater to the, the 40 plus crowd, uh, 40 and up that, isn't interested in competing, isn't interested in uh, ego lifting, right? Of like, let's just see how much I can do today. It's just like, no, you can still get a crazy pump by doing lightweight high reps, right? Um, and then I mean, it's kind of like body weight movements, you know? It's like, I'd rather do a thousand pushups than do a one rep max bench press any day, right? And I know some people are like, uh, no, <laughs> a thousand pushups, bro? Like, no. Um, <laughs> I've done that. It's 10 push-ups on the minute for a hundred minutes. Get it done. Right. Um, okay. That does get really boring, but, um, but you get the gist. It's, it's really just trying to not time yourself for these workouts. Um, and I tell people, even though there's breaks in between, like some of the workouts I'll be programming, there'll be breaks. I mean, what I like about the Vitruvian, even though like it might have a 30 second break, you know, where you're doing like max push-ups or something, you don't have to start right away. You know, I think the CrossFitter in my, me is like, oh, get back on it and like, like lift and start moving. There are times where I do my workouts and I literally might take two minutes and just like eat some watermelon. I don't know. Like, just like, I'm not in a rush, you know? And I think that that's where, you know, we need to go for people that are not interested in the performance side of things, right? Um, so that's what you can expect. It's just slow and steady wins the race. That's how I like to view it nowadays. So that thing that you said about when you first jumped on and it was your first impression and you you were like, whoa, what the hell is this? This is different. How do you explain that to to someone who has a history of training? Like they know their numbers, they know what they're used to in the gym um, when physics is, you know, normal. Like how do you explain that to someone? Because I think that's definitely something that we're always trying to help bridge the gap with people with. Yeah. I would say that, you know, with people that are so they know their numbers, they know where they're at. I would say this would be, I would almost challenge that person to use the platform and let go of all of that stuff. And that's hard, right? Because it's dogmatic. It's like, this is my religion. This is what I know. 
And now this is confusing me. It's like, that's not what I know, right? And I think there's something liberating about it that I have experienced personally. Once I just let it go, it's like, okay. Like I literally, the other day, I was like, okay, I'm going to do like, I think it was like 120 on a back squat. I was like, I'm just to see what this feels like. I failed the rep. I was like, oh, I'm not standing this up. And then I'm like, for a split second, I'm like, uh, I'm, I'm trash. I'm worthless. Oh my God. Like I'm weak. And then I was like, what's wrong with you? Like, just let it go. Like your body, it doesn't matter. Like it's almost like people that are chasing numbers on a scale. It's like, okay, let's, let's just forget the scale and just, just be, be present. And that's what I like is that I don't need to think about how much weight is on the bar. I just need to think about focusing on form and range of motion. Right. And that's it. And I think that that could, it's a really neat exercise for people that are like so crazed about numbers. Uh, and I said, look, it, it's actually kind of nice where, you know, because also people lift those numbers in the gym because they want people to see, right? Like, look how many plates are on my bar. Look at the bar bending. What did Hugh Jackman say when he's training for Wolverine? He was like, if the bar's not bending, you're just pretending. And it's like, okay, that's funny. But like now people are going to jack themselves up because they need to have the bar bending, right? And at home, there's no one, right? It's like, who am I trying to impress? Like, I just want to get a good look at it. And so I've been able to do that at home and it's nice. It's nice, especially for me, going to the gym, having a huge pump and being like, wow, I just got some strength training in. Now I can focus on body weight stuff. You know, if there's a, obviously I can do pull-ups in the gym, which I can't do at home. And so then I can, you know, tailor my workouts for the environment. So. But it is hard. I'm, I guarantee you people that are so used to, and I come from that world too, where it was hard at first, but then I realized it was just like ego. And I was just like, okay, let it go. Like, just be present and, um, you know, just have fun. So I just, I play music and truth to be told, I my guilty pleasure is like pop music. So I'll work out the Taylor Swift and stuff. And people are always like, are you listening to Taylor Swift? And I was like, what's it? <laughs> like, she's like, that's a power song. Like, whatever. Um, you are taking literally every question I have on my list. You're already answering before I can ask the question. One of my rapid fire questions was, what's your favorite workout song? Oh, my favorite one right now, I think is... Uh, I mean, honestly, any Taylor Swift song, that's like just anyone. Um, you don't have the ultimate like hype um, Taylor Swift song? Uh, no. There's got to be one. No. Surely. Okay, if there's one, I'm trying to think of my playlist that I'll like play all the time that I, okay, well, like if I'm in the gym, for some reason, I'm always listening to, uh, well, I can't say it's a bad word. Um, bad mother effer by uh, machine gun Kelly like that. I like, um, but at home, I mean, shake it off. Like, yeah, I'll just, that's like, that's it, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, no one, no one sees me. And then I, and then I posted, I'm like, well, now everyone sees me. I'm like, okay. And I was, that's cause I didn't know. Yeah. Yo, yeah. The next workout. I want Taylor Swift on top of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, people always comment on it. And I'm like, first off, I would argue that like, like I would say this in the gym, like when I work out the pop music, all the guys would make fun of me. And I I just in a jokingly, but kind of like passive aggressive way, I would say, well, I look the way that I do and you look the way you do. So I, I mean, until you look like me, you can't say anything, right? And that's what I used to say to the guys and just like mess with them. But, um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I think everyone's got, you know, like, well, what's your, what's your power song? Mine. Christine, you go first. I was going to say, I think I have a similar thing to you when I'm in the gym and there's people around me, my hype song is so different to when I'm at home. Mm -hmm. I think I'm like you, I'll, I'll listen to you know, 90s pop mm. or 90s R&B. Um, but in the gym is something, and I think it's it's got to be ego for sure. Like I want to 
peacock a little bit more and so i've got some like badass like edm beats oh, like in my EDM, okay. in in yeah okay. yeah like the the bassiest of the bass like pumping and i'm yeah just got like you know serious eyes on like don't don't mess with me kind of thing <laughs> i rediscovered eminem for me in my training days and that's like my at home or when i'm by myself training playlist and then you know the TikTok song the push up that's like really hard like hard style almost edm that's like my hype up song if i need to lift heavy in the gym that's that's awesome yeah i mean like for me i mean there's a, a whole um time when i was doing crossfit i mean i don't know why i was in this phase but i was just listening to enya like every workout even if it was for time and i was like doing fran i'd listen to enya and my like I, I always do it off hours when there wasn't a class but someone would walk in they're like what the hell are what are you listening to? I was like, dude, it's Enya. They're like, yeah, I know, but why? And I was like, I don't know. I don't know. It's just like, it's, it's something I'm into right now. Um, so yeah, I mean, today I was in the gym and I just have it on shuffle. So it was anything from, you know, that one, one hit wonders, uh, band Metro station shake or shake, shake it. Yes. Yeah. Love that song. <laughs> It's like so catchy. And so for me, it's always pop, like something that's upbeat, bubbly, fun. Um, that usually keeps me in a good mood. And then it, then I'll get into like rap, R&B, but typically like rap, like a lot of Wiz Khalifa, Machine Gun Kelly, um, 50 Cent, stuff like that. Um, Any heavy metal? Um, yeah, actually, I just went to not, uh, not super heavy metal, but like, I mean, I'm a fan of almost all genres. Um, but I just went to go see Guns N' Roses last night, and that was quite the experience. Uh, one of my um, clients is uh, the tour manager for them. So he was in town. I had dinner with him. We got coffee, and he's like, hey, man, I got you um, awesome seats. I also got you a pit pass so you can come down to front stage. So we, me and my – and I had a plus one, so I brought my friend. We went down in the pit. It was awesome. Now, seeing Axl Rose, I mean, I'm like, wow. He's very old. They're all slash old. They all look so old, but like, whoa, impressive, right? They could still rock out. I did not know their full catalog and you didn't need to. They just, it was there. It was great. It was, it was so much fun. Um, and of course they saved Paradise City for the very last song. Um, so you had to stay, but I would have stayed anyway. It was awesome. And Slash, I've never, I, you're so close that I'm like watching him shred on that guitar i was just like i can't even move my fingers that fast by themselves doing nothing right and he's playing an instrument it's just it, it was insane so it was cool but heavy metal mm, yeah i like you know rage i wouldn't even say rage is heavy metal but like you know metallica you know all that kind of stuff um i i'm not opposed to like death metal like screaming and like, blah, like that stuff is kind of cool once in a while but um you know it's uh no, I might go to. So. Yeah, I, I think like I, I wasn't thinking death metal, but when I think about death metal, I just think it's just so aggressive, and I, I just I feel attacked almost. Like I don't need to feel yeah, attacked I'm like, I'm when I'm enough like, stress on my body right now through exercise. I don't need yeah, to add more stress psychologically. You know? Yeah. I agree yeah. Yeah. I'm. I'm. Yeah. That's where I'm at. Yeah. Very cool. The um, next rapid fire question would be one exercise you can't live without. Oh, oh, if I choose one exercise, I would say the pull up um, because it's such a great exercise. And more importantly, I mean, I always tell people, hey, if you're hanging off the ledge of a building, you can't pull yourself up over that ledge. Your life is over and they're like whoa and i was like yeah so maybe you should learn how to do some pull-ups and so i would say that because everything else you know you can like squats you can just do air squats and stuff like that but like equipment based stuff i would always say just a pull-up um, but for me my favorite movement is the ghd sit-up and that's just i'm obsessed with it i do like 300 that's a crossfit I, know. <laughs> I know but i do i do so many i do like 200 to 400 reps a week and um, it's, uh, it's my favorite movement for sure. 
Um, so yeah. Okay. Um, what's the best place you've ever exercised in besides pulling you out from the edge of a building? Yeah. Uh, I would say one of the coolest places I've worked out at was the Tulum jungle gym in Tulum, Mexico. Um, which is the famous one that everyone is you know, like, it's all over Instagram. That was the coolest place. Um, just because it was so iconic and it's just right on the beach and it's just like, this is so cool. All the weights were wood and it's just like, so cool. So that would be one of the coolest places. Um, but I did go to a CrossFit gym in Warsaw, Poland, which was super cool. Um, that was a cool experience, but yeah, I would say Tulum. Nice one. I like it. The classic Instagram. Of course. Gym. I even did the Instagram reel on it where I was like, it was this trending audio file. So it's like me, um, what was that? Uh, I put the phone down and I step on it and I pick it back up and then I'm in a different place. So I had planned this. I'm like, we're going to Tulum. Oh, this is going to be awesome. So I pre record this first thing and I'm like, this is so silly. I'm taking this video. Then I'm not going to take this. I'm not going to finish the video until we're all the way there. And then once I, it all came together, I was like, oh, so it was worth it. it was so cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, do and lastly your go-to post-workout snack um meal. i for me i like doing a, a protein shake so um i actually am in the process of starting a supplement company so what i like is just 100 percent beef isolate um i don't i know that their whey is really great but whey i just it upsets my stomach and i i just don't like whey protein so I like hundred percent beef isolate. Um, so, and it's just, that's it. And so the protein powder that I'm going to be, um, you know, selling soon, uh, the name of it is basic AF. And the reason I wanted that and I trademarked it. So like I just filed for the trademark, which is awesome. But I, it's all this kind of this play on look in life, you never want to be basic, but when it comes to your protein powder, you need to be basic as AF because honestly, I still want to promote real whole food, right? So it's like, hey, if you want a peanut butter protein shake, then put peanut butter in it. Don't get a synthetic peanut butter flavor. You want banana, throw banana in it. So what I like, my thing is going to be uh, frozen wild blueberries, um, almond milk, um, almond butter, crunchy, gotta be crunchy, and then uh, banana, and then two scoops of that beef isolate. And that that to me is like a dessert. It's like so good uh so that's my go-to thing post-workout i like it and if people want to connect with you after the podcast and they're inspired by your journey where can they find you, you? can find me on instagram or tiktok under beyond the tats uh and that's really where you can find me so and, then and, and also if you want to you can go to beyond the if you're interested in coaching and you can check that out too so and to finish up the episode, what's your favorite quote? I feel like you've mentioned so many good ones. Is there any favorite quote that you've got to keep people motivated or keep yourself motivated? Um, I, for me, I always tell people like, try to create a mantra, right? Um, something that's short, concise, positively charged. That's going to get you out of a funk, right? And so for me, I always just tell myself, keep moving, keep moving. And it could be moving mentally or physically. Um, because when you're lying in a hospital bed with your chest sawed open, you're, gonna, you're not moving, right? But like for me, it was just keep moving mentally, get to the next second, get to the next moment. Um, because any momentum, physical or mentally, is, is momentum in the right direction, right? It's forward momentum. So... Um, so yeah, I just, that's what I always tell myself, even with workouts where I don't feel like working out, I'm like, keep moving, keep moving, just keep moving. So. Some powerful messages. I think that was really inspiring. And thank you so much for coming onto the podcast. I think the listeners can get a whole lot out of it. And if you're not motivated to get moving now or just have some fun with your workouts, I don't know how else we could help yeah, honestly if, if not just follow my page and i make people laugh so it's uh, like my, a lot of my content is <laughs> fitness related it's just hey i'm 40 and it sucks or like hey you know i struggle with you know anxiety or whatever you know it's just like i think you know 
Try to find people on social media. And that's another thing. You really need to curate who you're following and fo follow people that inspire you, make you laugh. And I think the world needs more laughter now more than ever. And that's why my platform is very transparent, but also it's just a lot of comedy because I feel like I, this truth be told, and it sounds really sad, but I watch my reels more than other people. Like, because I, I just, I, it's so funny. I'm like, that was so funny. I like, I have to watch it again. I, it's so funny. And if I find it funny, someone's going to find it funny. So, you know, just, um, you know, it's so easy to fall in those pitfalls of like following people that just have toxic messages or whatever, but you know, just, we all need to be happier and more positive by sharing positivity. You know? And for me, it's just laughter. So. Such a good well, message. Um, I'm mm. I'm for yeah. Well, I'm glad the technology Can held I up have... for the whole call. This was great. And, uh, <laughs> no, I really appreciate both your, uh, time and, um, you know, whenever you want to do this again, I, I love, uh, as you can tell, I like to talk. So, you know, whenever. So. So thank you so much. Okay.